Our topic today is lyrics, and at the same time, I think we're going to be talking about poetry. At the heart of each is the metaphor, comparison between two things that you take seriously. So you don't say Juliet is like the sun in a certain set of ways, because that would just be a simile. You say uh, Juliet is the sun. They're one and the same thing. And now you have to explore that analogy to its fullest extent. To some extent, all language is metaphorical. When I say the word tree, I make a comparison between a bunch of different plants that have some similarities. I'm focusing on that similarity, and that becomes a concept to me. All poetry, all lyrics does is recognize the metaphorical nature of language and express unconventional truths by leaning into it. So in order for metaphor to work, you have to have an understanding of what words you're comparing mean. So a tree is a plant, it's sturdy, it's tall, it grows, some of them lose their leaves, some of them don't, but they will remain standing and grow for hundreds of years. I feel like metaphors fall on deaf ears a lot of times because people fail to recognize what the words truly mean in that context. Yeah, you're picking out what the important part of something is. When I talk about Juliet being the sun, I, in that moment, don't really care about what she had for breakfast or what kind of smut she reads. I just care that she's a radiant person, and that's the essential quality of Juliet. What smut does Juliet read? Real talk. Probably very problematic smut. She got daddy issues. What's a smut? Fanfic. Oh, my coworker brings those into work. NSFW. Connor, are you uh, currently referencing the document that I drafted up, um, referencing elements of poetry? I have all of those documents up. I'm to some extent basing my rambling on that, yes. Nice. I will say I'm a big fan of alliteration. I will say, as of recently, I've found myself gravitating towards that. It's just very fun. Yeah, I think it's safe to say good lyrics work on two levels. You're communicating something that's interesting, that's thoughtful, and also it sounds good. It's like, it, it's an instrument in itself. Yeah. Tech Nine taught me that alliteration is very important when it comes to certain things and when to choose to use it and when to choose not to use it. Because it can make things like slur together way too much, but it can also purposely make things slur together way too much. I could ramble about hip hop lyric stuff for a while. But... Hip hop and metal are also very similar in that regards. <laughs> like screaming and rapping, they're both quote unquote unpitched. I mean, every vocalization has a fundamental frequency. Screaming's just complex pitch, and rap's just very flowy and uh, often microtonal pitch. But the point of it is you're, you're treating melody and rhythm as the same thing, and it's all based on the sound of the words, the texture of the words, and that's the essence of flow. Well, something I was thinking about today was how different words, you can theoretically beatbox while saying them. Like burlap sack, burlap sack. You're already like saying a thing. So if you're doing like a rhyme with that type beat, you're going to want to find words to at least start off with that type beat and then kind of keep like playing off those with like the consonants and the like syllables you're making. That's one of my favorite parts of like crafting lyrics. I love experimenting around with that. I'll usually start with something silly like daffodils dancing downhill. I'm coughing, you know, something silly and then it'll lead into something else and it's kind of like sparks the inspo. Mm -hmm. It's quite fun. I'm kind of similar. I, a lot of the time it starts with the sound of words. Um, I know Mike Patton, he said that he usually starts from just how words sound, how they feel, and you kind of stumble into the meaning later on. Yeah. But it's an instrument. It's part of the band, and so you want to make sure the sounds you're choosing work well with the sounds everybody else is choosing. One of the things he once said that, like, I mean, made me rethink how to, like, compose lyrics was he went, cha. And since then, yeah. Then that scene from fucking Ice Age happened, and yeah, he's been on to something. Revolutionary. Now, 
as far as flow goes, when you're writing, how do you gauge when and how to change the flow if it's necessary in the first place? Because sometimes you can maintain a flow for the entire verse, but every instrument is called a voice. And the voices need to change throughout the song to show growth in the progression of the story that you're trying to tell. How do you as writers try to gauge that? Personally, it's a bit instinctual and experimental. I just kind of do what feels right in the moment. And then usually if it if it like feels good, I, I like get a feeling and I'm like, ooh, that was good. That was really, really good. Like, yeah, it's just, it's more instinctual for me. But I also will sit back and reflect on how it all, you know, flows as a whole throughout, you know, because I kind of have to gauge like the energy levels, like the ups and downs as well in proportion to the ups and downs of the instruments and how they kind of balance together um, and whether or not I want them to or not for any particular reason. In order to balance them out, do you tend to change the flow or the rhythm section more or the instrumental voices in the piece like if you come up with a flow and you really like the change but the beat doesn't necessarily go with it are you more inclined to change the flow or the beat behind it usually the flow because i'm pretty much a stickler to a beat that i've made because i craft beats first and then i build lyrics afterwards that's, that's kind of how I am. But there are instances in which I'm like, mm, it might actually bode well if I keep the rhythm of the vocals and maybe take away or add an instrument or two, you know, to make it less overwhelming or, you know, less noisy. What about you, Connor? How do you gauge it? It's, I mean, I think very similar. It's mostly instinctual. I listen to a lot of music. I've internalized what I know I like and what the pacing I feel like it needs to be. And it also depends on the kind of song it is. When we listen to music, our experience is shaped by our expectations. And based on the rest of the song and based on the previous... uh, Previous music that we've listened to throughout our life that we have related to in a certain way, shape, or form. Yeah, based on our experiences with music... I mean, we naturally form predictions. That's that's how we, we exist in the world. You're predicting your foot's going to land in front of you, even if you're not looking at it. And if you can't predict, you can't function as an organism. And when we listen to music, we're making predictions and being rewarded for getting it right or being rewarded for our expectations being subverted in a way that expands our understanding of the music. And so you need to think about, are you changing just enough that you're setting expectations in a convincing way but not enough that the listener ever gets bored. Or conversely, maybe the the point of it is you're trying to force the listener to get this idea ingrained in their head. Sometimes the point can be not to change up the flow. I, on a personal level, get bored very often. So when I craft music, I try to keep myself entertained by switching it up, but I also want the listener to be constantly engaged because I want to surprise them at every turn. Come up with something that gives them whiplash, but not enough that they change the song. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes that might include throwing in something a little nonsensical, you know, contextually. But then it'd all come, it'll come full circle. Especially with predictive melody, using a sound or a flow or a stop that seems unorthodox is necessary to bring the listener back in especially if the song follows a formula that a lot of other music does yeah not everyone likes to be comfortable all the time and it does expand your horizons if you're made to think about it like switching to a 5-4 all of a sudden keep them on their toes recently I've been challenging myself not to follow like the standard uh, strong song structures that a lot of people, you know, gravitate towards. So like, instead of like, a, you know, verse, chorus, verse, bridge. Yeah. Um, it's like, Oh, maybe it's going to be a verse and then a bridge type segment and then the chorus, but there's only one chorus and then there's a verse afterwards and then it just ends. Like that's my most recent project I've been working on. 
So I'm trying to switch things up and challenge myself to that degree. Because it's also fun because like, I don't have many reference points to listen to for that. So I kind of have to make it up myself and figure out what fits. And that's the challenge. And I really enjoy that aspect. Coming up with sound that you haven't heard before and all of a sudden it sparks something. Yeah, because I mean, that's how music has evolved over time. It's people merging new ideas together, creating something new that no one's heard before. And then it picks up and you're like, whoa, and then a whole new genre of music is kind of flourishes into existence. It's wonderful. Leonard Bernstein was talking to Stephen Sondheim, two like musical writers, and the big piece of advice he passed on was you should never let your time signature get in the way of your melody. So if the phrasing's awkward and like you're struggling to fit the melody to the instrumental um, or to a specific meter, there's nothing wrong with just like cutting out two beats, ripping them out of the whole song. And there's a lot of songs that, I mean, you listen to, you can't really tell they're in irregular time signatures because the melody makes sense. It's intuitive. And it's a good lesson to take away on the level of time signature, but also on the level of song structure. If your song doesn't need three choruses, you don't need three choruses. Yeah. Avoiding redundancy is very important when writing music, and that's a very fine line to toe because if the hook is catchy, you should repeat it just enough that they can't get it out of their head and they have to listen to the song again. But like, at what point does it become too much for that particular run of the song rather than just making them rewind and listen to it again? At least in the 21st century, all my homies have attention deficit issues. Facts. It's also a function of, I mean, how streaming works. You're incentivized to make shorter songs. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Technology has always shaped how we consume music. The length of an album, the uh, A side and B side of an album, that's completely arbitrary. That's based on the fact that we happen to use records instead of some other medium to consume music. But that's also why it's really interesting. James got in one of her documents about album structure. Oh, yeah. You have a note that it helps to separate the A side and the B side with a, an extended gap. An interlude of sorts? I mean, there's that uh, interesting thing Jane pointed out. Just like more silence between the end of the A side and the start of the B side than between other tracks. And that's a substitute for the fact that you no longer need to get up, walk over to your record player, flip over the record. I mean, yeah, thinking about A-side and B-side, this is how we've been encultured. It's how we understand the structure of an album. So you're substituting that time it takes and that sense of like reset, sitting with your thoughts for a second and then going back into it for the B part. I will say that was what the article told me when I read it, so I jotted that down. So that was not an original thought process, but it is something that I have contemplated and I'm very grateful to whoever wrote that online, so thank you. I mean, none of my thoughts are original. All my homies are derivative. Are any forms of thought really original? Question mark? I think it's a lot like music. It's all remixes of earlier thoughts. You just happen to have enough different influences that you can remix ideas in ways that Um, seem original and seem new and provide new ways to think about things for other people you communicate to. I found myself recently gravitating more towards concise. Like the past three songs I've been working on, they're all about like two minutes long. So they're on the shorter side. One of them's like a minute and a half, but they're like higher tempos and I'm just like a lot more concise with the energy and the pacing and like the message contained in it. But I think it's also ties back into what you said about ADD is like, I, you know, that's me. I have that and I get bored. So I try to like make something shorter that just is like snappy and then you can move on to the next thing. So sometimes when I'm sitting in the car, I'm like, I love this song, but it's a little bit long and I want to listen to something else now. So I have to like skip it. Sometimes just in the mood for something shorter like that, you know, something punchy. There's also a a difference in like compositional style. Sometimes it helps for musicians to like develop something through extended jamming. And the thing is just stepping back and arranging it afterwards. It's very easy to get lost in the sauce, jam forever and think it's the best thing ever. But you were also there. You had the context of your own emotions, of the sensation of the instrument against your body. And you don't know that that's going to translate. Music is a form of communication. Music that's very informationally dense, 
that has a lot to say at every moment of it, I think that's more effective than if you have a lot to say and you need to stretch it, which, I mean, I say this, but I'm working on a 13 minute song right now. But it's also uh, contextual. Like yes. it, it, like you said, circling back, it's all dependent on what the intention is going in, crafting mm-hmm. the work. So. And at the same time, you need to think about if you're arranging an album and you want it to be an album experience, you need to treat it like a 30 minute to hour and a half long um, experience. This also uh, might be kind of gravitating a little off topic, but if you ever perform music and it's like all high energy, you're going to get worn out by the end of the by the end of the show and may not even be able to finish. Like, I feel like you need to think about your energy exertion and like recovery time during that hour period when you perform. I feel like you need to consider the audience's energy level at that point too if you're headlining in a four band lineup and you have a high energy set that lasts an hour people are going to be worn out yeah that's just the fact you can train as much as you'd like you can get the song perfect but if the audience doesn't have the energy to match your energy they're not going to take away from it what you might want them to that's a really good point. That's not something I've thought about before. I was going to say Lil Darkie has talked about this in interviews repeatedly where he had to entirely change how he even writes the songs he writes because he's like, yeah, one, the audience can't maintain the high energy that I had in the studio while writing these songs. And two, I can't maintain the energy the audience needs me to have on stage to perform all these songs. If I'm going to be going for an hour, I can't like write these songs that are like breath for breath. Like it's just not a thing. So that's why he changed how he wrote songs. And that's why they changed how they did the Spider Gang tour the second time they went around because he's like, yeah, the audience was not there at the end. It's hard to mosh for two hours. It's hard to mosh for 30 minutes. It's hard to mosh for 15 minutes. Yeah. Unless you're on drugs. I am. Even if you're on on drugs, that shit hard. I stay on them. I might have the wrong perks, but like... (laughs) Sorry for bringing up drugs, Connor. Crack rock. I smoke that shit. Heroin. Fentanyl. in the veins. Fenty in the earballs. More drugs. Heroin. In the shell eyes. I don't... A pint of acid in my throat. LSD tracheotomy. Ah. <laughs> that made me uncomfortable.